About 40 years ago, I became a member of the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks, BPOE, the best people on earth. I went through an elaborate initiation ceremony. I associated myself with other men in the gymnasium. We played handball. We played racquetball. We had really, really a very good time. During the course of my entry into that body as a member, I came to learn that its founding was in New York State in the late 19th century, and it was founded as a drinking club. It was called the Jolly Corks at that time. And over the course of the years, the Elks and other similar animal lodges all organized themselves around some type of social scheme. On the other hand, the Independent Order of Foresters, the Knights of Columbus, and organizations of a similar ilk were organized to provide life insurance benefits for people who otherwise could not obtain life insurance. How different is that from the Catholic Church in origin? Once again, this is Father Eugene Tracy, and today I'd like to discuss the divine origin of the Catholic Church, and indeed the divine origin of the Church of Christ, which one finds within the Catholic Church. And to a certain extent in this discussion, I am also including the Orthodox churches because the Orthodox churches of the East have maintained the same seven sacraments as the Catholic Church and the same priesthood and are indeed true churches. This is a question that has been asked over the years. Where did the church come from? Well, we would say as Catholics that the church came from Jesus Christ. We don't know exactly when he began its formation. One could say that when Mary and Joseph gave birth to him in the manger in Bethlehem, that that was the beginning of the church because Mary and Joseph were called to be his first disciples. It could have been at his presentation in the temple when Anna and Simeon announced that the Messiah was at hand and became his followers. It could have been at his finding in the temple when he was at 12 years old instructing the Jewish leaders and answering their questions about the faith. It could have been, for instance, at his crucifixion when blood and water flowed from his side. It could have been at his resurrection. But we do know that at, by the time of his ascension, he had definitively organized a church on the foundation stones of the apostles and at his ascension commanded them to go and to teach and to proclaim that salvation was at hand. On the day of Pentecost, God the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles and they began to fulfill their mission. We read in St. Paul's writing the analogy of a body used to describe the church. St. Paul describes the mystical body of Christ as being composed of our Lord Jesus Christ as its head and the rest of us who are joined to him through his invitation as members of that mystical body. And that is a very, very apt way of describing the church. In fact, some 2,000 years roughly later, the Second Ecumenical Council held at the Vatican took up that question in the 1960s and described the church, in fact, as a mystery. That is a reality that can be experienced, but not necessarily completely understood. The church can be lived, but not necessarily completely described. The mystical body of Christ, they laid alongside the idea of the pilgrim people on earth, people following our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life in the world to come. A prefiguring of that event would be the exodus of the children of Israel into the promised land through their crossing of the Red Sea. Another way that the council described the church was to use the metaphor of a bride relating to a bridegroom, and the church then becomes the bride of Christ. That also has its roots in St. Paul, for instance, because in the fifth chapter of the Epistle to the Ephesians, he compares the relationship between a husband and wife to that of our Lord Jesus Christ and the church, a relationship that is exclusive, a relationship that is permanent, and a relationship that is fruitful. And these have served for many, many years as ways of describing the church. So starting at that with the foundation, I'd like now to switch to a contemporary theologian, Cardinal Avery Dulles, some time ago, a prominent Jesuit theologian in the United States, now deceased, wrote a small book entitled Models of the Church. 
It went through two or three editions, and many of its chapters were misunderstood. I had occasion to have lunch with Cardinal Dulles one time when he visited Spokane, and I asked him about the book, and he said it was the most popular, he thought, of all of the books that he had written because it was so universally misunderstood. Father Dulles described the church as a composite of six different models. Not that each one would be separate, describing six separate churches, but he described one church in six different expressions. The misunderstanding of the book, he explained, was that many people would select one and ignore the other five. One of the ways that Father Dulles explained the church was as an institution, and he talked about the organization of the church. He talked about the church teaching and sanctifying and ruling, governing in faith and in morals, professing approved doctrines and administering legitimate sacraments. That is a very apt way of describing the gift that our Lord has left us. One, we might say, a description of the mission of the church. Unfortunately, people today have perverted that from church as institution to something called the institutional church, in which they attempt to set up the hierarchy of the church, the bishops and priests, as somehow opposed to the real church, which is the church of themselves. A second model that Father Dulles used was the description of the church as community, the body of Christ. That is a worshiping community of believers who by their faith become a sign and an instrument of the union of God and man. Now, of course, any mature thinker would say, well, that is probably just another side of the coin of the church like institution or another side of the die, the six-faced die, because the church given to us as an institution by Christ is reflected in the community in which we live. Now, that brings us to the third facet, and that is the church's sacrament. And this is a really, really good understanding of the church or way that people experience the church because the church is understood as the visible manifestation of the grace of Christ in the human community. One way of understanding a sacrament is to see it as a created reality pointing to an uncreated reality. That is, it is a creature of God that points to God himself and in fact helps man establish union with him. A sacrament in and of itself is not a magic act. Rather, it is an encounter between God and man. The one who is created, reaching to the creator, the uncreated, and entering into a deeper relationship with him. Hence, the church as a sacrament leads to Christ, the incarnate God, and then leads through Christ to the unseen God in the world to come. Now, another facet of the church is that of being a herald, that is, one who announces. A faithful people who hear the word of God and keep it. The herald of the church are people putting their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior and proclaiming the Christ event in their lives, recognizing that the way they lead their lives is the way that people will come to know our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody told me a story the other day illustrating this point. It seems that there was a woman who was driving a car and she was in somewhat of a hurry and she was agitated and going through an intersection, another car ran into her, the other driver having run the red light. So the aggrieved woman got out of the car, cursing like a sailor, making all kinds of judgments, calling down the wrath of God on the poor unfortunate man who hit her when the police officer arrived. The police officer made an assessment of the situation and promptly arrested the woman. In the back of the police car, taken to the station, she was protesting. The other driver hit me. He's the one who ran the red light. What did I do? Why are you arresting me? And then began the sailor talk again. And so they got her to the police station and they put her in a room. And before too much longer, a senior officer came in and announced that the arresting officer had made a mistake. Everything was straightened out and she was free to go. And he gave her the address of the repair yard to where her car had been towed. And she says, well, what happened? Why was I arrested? I did nothing wrong. 
and the senior officer said that the arresting officer was simply mistaken because he looked at the bumper stickers on her car that read, follow me to church. My God is a fisherman. They had the little fish thing, the coexist bumper sticker. And he concluded from looking at that and looking at her behavior that the car had been stolen. It had been resolved then and she was free to go. The reality of it is, is that faith on Sunday at Holy Mass needs to be reflected in one's life on Monday morning. And the facet of the church as a herald does that. The fifth facet of the church, according to Father Dulles, is that the church functions as a redeemed people who have a mandate to establish in the world Christ's kingship of peace, justice, love, and reconciliation. And so the institution of the church lived then in a community functioning as a sacrament of our Lord Jesus Christ and as a herald of his message also functions as Christ the servant, reaching out to the poor and the disadvantaged in the same way that our Lord did when he walked on the grounds of this earth. Now, we come to the sixth facet of the church, and that is the church as a school of discipleship. And that is the one that ties all of the others together. Because true disciples of Christ desire to know him and to love him and to serve him. They enter into a process and a pattern of life that brings them close to him and then helps round out the church. And then we can come to the purpose of these podcasts and the purpose of these films. It is to enable people to enter more deeply into discipleship with our Lord and to walk in his footsteps, to walk one's life as a sacrament and as a herald and as a servant, and of course, as a disciple. The mystical body of Christ then functions as the bride of Christ, living hand in glove with her founder. God bless you.